Dzień dobry. Szanowni Państwo, witam wszystkich bardzo serdecznie w gmachu Ministerstwa Spraw Zagranicznych na wspólnej konferencji naszego gościa, sekretarza stanu Antoniego Blinkena i ministra spraw zagranicznych Radosława Sikorskiego. Szanowni Państwo, najpierw poproszę o zabranie głosu gospodarza pana ministra Sikorskiego. Dzień dobry Państwu. Bardzo się cieszę, że mogę gościć w Warszawie w Ministerstwie Spraw Zagranicznych sekretarza stanu USA Antoniego Blinkena i to w momencie, gdy wraca on z Kijowa, gdzie dzieją się ważne rzeczy i gdzie odbył spotkania z przedstawicielami ukraińskich władz. To najpilniejsza, najważniejsza kwestia w naszych stosunkach dwustronnych. Relacje Polska-Stany Zjednoczone są na najwyższym poziomie intensywności w historii. Tegoroczna dynamika jest imponująca, łączą nas wspólne wartości, interesy i podobne postrzeganie zagrożeń. Wierzę, że nasza współpraca na rzecz wspierania Kijowa będzie kontynuowana do końca tej administracji i przez następną administrację i że przyczyni się do jak najszybszego zakończenia rosyjskiej agresji z uwzględnieniem racji zaatakowanej Ukrainy. Zapewnienie bezpieczeństwa Ukrainie, a więc strategicznemu przedpolu całego Sojuszu Północnoatlantyckiego pozostaje naszym wspólnym priorytetem i będziemy kontynuowali te wysiłki. Polska pozostaje zwolennikiem zwiększania presji na reżim rosyjski w celu zmuszenia go do zakończenia wojny przeciwko Ukrainie. Od początku staliśmy w awangardzie wysiłków na rzecz pomocy wojskowej i nie tylko. Jako Zachód powinniśmy kontynuować dostarczanie Ukrainie zaawansowanych systemów obrony powietrznej i przeciwrakietowej, a także uważamy znieść ograniczenia na użycie broni dalekiego zasięgu. Jesteśmy przekonani o skuteczności sankcji ekonomicznych, apelując jednocześnie o podjęcie bardziej zdecydowanych działań na rzecz konfiskaty zamrożonych rosyjskich aktywów. O ile wsparcie dla Ukrainy pozostaje jedną z najistotniejszych kwestii w naszych relacjach, o tyle współpraca z Waszyngtonem oczywiście wykracza daleko poza te ramy. Jesteśmy dla siebie kluczowymi partnerami w dziedzinie bezpieczeństwa. Amerykańska obecność wojskowa w naszym kraju, o co zabiegały kolejne rządy, w tym w części o charakterze stałym, istotnie przyczynia się do wzrostu polskiego bezpieczeństwa. Modernizujemy nasze siły zbrojne, także dzięki zakupom w Stanach Zjednoczonych. Samoloty F-16, F-35, ostatnio śmigłowce Apache, czołgi Abrams, systemy HIMARS i Patriot. Obok zacieśniającej się współpracy politycznej z Polską, USA stają się coraz istotniejszym partnerem Polski również w innych dziedzinach. Mamy rozkwit relacji gospodarczych, w tym współpracy energetycznej, wymiany handlowej oraz technologicznej. Chciałbym jeszcze raz podziękować Tonemu Blinkowi za dzisiejsze spotkanie, możliwość omówienia najważniejszych kwestii. Dialog będziemy kontynuować w Nowym Jorku na marginesie Zgromadzenia Ogólnego Narodów Zjednoczonych. Szanowni Państwo, a teraz poproszę o kilka słów pana sekretarza Antoniego Blinkena. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, and let me just say at the outset uh, to my friend Radek, um, thank you for being such a great partner for the United States, but thank you especially for being such a long time and staunch defender of democracy, wherever it's threatened, wherever it's challenged. Uh, we could not be more grateful for that. Uh, and also, uh, if you'll allow me a point of personal privilege, I'm especially pleased as well to uh, be here with my, my friend, Ambassador Mark Brzezinski. Uh, the Brzezinski family has now for two generations contributed in remarkable ways to uh, our foreign policy, to our national discourse, and um, having Mark here at this time uh, could not be more important and more beneficial. Uh, to both of our countries. Uh, as Radek said, um, I'm here from Ukraine, uh, 
was there, as you, as you know, with Foreign Secretary Lamy. Uh, we had a very good visit. We went to Kiev to underscore our united and unwavering support for Ukraine faced with the ongoing Russian aggression. United States, United Kingdom, but also united with so many other countries who've come together in support uh, of Ukraine. All committed not just to helping uh, Ukraine ward off the aggression, but committed to uh, Ukraine's long-term success. Its success is a country that stands strongly on its own two feet, militarily, economically, democratically. Uh, and in our conversations in, uh, in Kyiv, we talked about our shared strategy to get there. Um, what we learn from our Ukrainian partners will inform discussions that we'll be having with other allies uh, and other partners uh, in the days and weeks ahead uh, as we work through and think through the coming months. And it's very fitting for us to begin that conversation with our allies here in Poland. Uh, Poland has been an absolutely essential partner to Ukraine from the moment that Putin reinvaded the country in 2022. Uh, it's provided $4 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. Tanks, aircraft, air defense, helicopters. It's one of 26 countries that have now signed bilateral security agreements uh, with Ukraine. These agreements, long-term commitments to help Ukraine build its deterrent and defense capacity, are critical not just in the immediate, but critical over time to make sure that Ukraine, for many years, has the capacity to defend itself. And of course, it's uh, been working alongside other NATO allies to help train Ukrainians, uh, including here uh, in Poland. Uh, and it's going to host the NATO-Ukraine Joint Analysis Training and Education Center so that the alliance can draw on lessons learned from the war. Uh, as many of you know, and as you see every time we, uh, we go uh, into Ukraine, it's also the key hub for getting assistance to Ukraine and to the Ukrainian people. More than 80% of all security and humanitarian assistance for Ukraine is flowing through Poland. And of course, Poland continues to host some one million Ukrainian refugees. This is a remarkable display of generosity and solidarity in a time when it's most needed. Uh, these joint efforts to support Ukraine, to help it defend against the Russian aggression, are a critical uh, facet of our relationship, but only one facet of the relationship in our security cooperation, which, in my judgment, has never been stronger. Um, Poland is, spe is spending over 4% of GDP on defense. This is really the gold standard among NATO countries. And uh, we saw uh, at the NATO summit just a few months ago the extraordinary progress the alliance has made in countries stepping up and dedicating the necessary resources to defense. In 2020, uh, nine NATO allies were meeting the 2% threshold. Now it's 23, but Poland has really been leading the way. And of course, it hosts thousands of U.S. and allied forces. Um, we have also a remarkable relationship when it comes to financing uh, the necessary expenditures on defense. Uh, there are now some $11 billion worth of uh, loans through our foreign military financing program that we've dedicated to Poland to help it modernize its forces, including with F-35 aircraft, with the largest fleet of Apache helicopters outside the United States, and the co-production of Patriot missile defense systems. These investments are good for Poland's security. They're good for NATO's capabilities. They're good for the United States, for our security, for our industry, and for our jobs. I also want to underscore the very important collaboration we have when it comes to energy security. Since February 22, Poland has made very important strides when it comes to increasing its own energy security. We see this in the context of extraordinary strides across Europe, moving away from dependence on Russian energy and developing uh, different sources and self-sufficiency. Uh, Foreign Minister and I discussed ways that the United States can further support Poland's transition away from Russian energy by facilitating the production of safe, clean, and reliable nuclear energy. Poland is also one of several nations across the region that uh, has been subject to Russian sabotage, cyber operations, uh, including with the support of the regime in Belarus. This is something that uh, the entire alliance is seized with. We see this, unfortunately, across Europe. So we're deepening our cooperation to protect our countries and fellow democracies from Moscow's malign efforts. 
Uh, in June, we came together in Warsaw with over a dozen countries, with the European Union, with NATO, to create the Ukraine Communications Group. Together, we're coordinating efforts to expose and to counter Kremlin misinformation and disinformation and put out accurate reporting on Russia's ongoing aggression. 25 years ago, when Poland joined NATO, my very illustrious predecessor, Secretary Madeleine Albright, said this, and I quote, we know that when the democracies of Europe and America are divided, crevices are created through which the forces of evil and aggression may emerge, but that when we stand together, no force on earth is more powerful than our solidarity on behalf of freedom. That was true then, it remains true today, and we continue to stand strongly together, Poland and the United States, for our own freedom and the freedom of others. Dziękuję bardzo. Szanowni Państwo, teraz jest czas dla Was. Ze strony amerykańską ustaliliśmy, że będą po dwa pytania ze strony polskiej i ze strony amerykańskiej. Pierwsze pytanie, Polsat News. Katarzyna Pysta, Polsat News. Um, Mr. Secretary of State, uh, welcome. I have question for both you and uh, Minister Sikorski here. Um, sir. Is there a green light for Ukraine to hit targets uh, deep inside Russia using Western weaponry? Uh, there were reports that this decision has already been made. Uh, there are also reports uh, that uh, London um, has uh, given its permission uh, recently. So if you could comment uh, on that. And for Minister Sikorski uh, in Polish, Panie Ministrze, powiedział Pan, że Polska jest za zwiększaniem presji na Moskwę. Chciałabym zapytać, jak to zielone światło na uderzanie w cele w głębi Rosji, jakie ono ma znaczenie oczywiście dla Ukrainy i co może zmienić, ale też jakie znaczenie ma dla Polski i dla naszego bezpieczeństwa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look, a hallmark of what we've done from day one, uh, in fact, even before day one, uh, of the Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2022, was to try to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs, when it needs it, to deal with that aggression. And as what Russia is doing has, has changed, as the battlefield has changed, we've adapted. Uh, and as you've seen through uh, the provision of some of the most sophisticated weapon systems we've had, through the extraordinary provision of um, military assistance overall, more than $100 billion uh, from the United States, uh, the uh, sharing of intelligence uh, and many other things at every step along the way as necessary we've adapted and we've adjusted and one of the um, purposes of my visit to uh, Kyiv yesterday was to hear from our Ukrainian partners what they believe they need now to deal with the current battlefield um, including in eastern Ukraine uh, and other parts of the country and I can tell you that uh, as we go forward, we will do exactly what we have already done, which is we will adjust, we'll adapt as necessary, including with regard to the means that are at uh, Ukraine's dis disposal to effectively defend against the Russian aggression. Russia popełnia zbrodnie wojenne, atakując cele cywilne, budynki mieszkalne, szpitale, Przede wszystkim y, zdolności do wytwarzania, do wytwarzania ciepła i y, elektryczności, a zima nadchodzi. Rakiety, które uderzają w te cywilne cele są wystrzeliwane z bombowców z nad terytorium Rosji, a te bombowce startują y, z lotnisk na terenie Rosji. Ofiara agresji ma prawo się bronić ma prawo zwalczać środki napadu powietrznego, które w nią uderzają. Więc uważam, że Ukraina ma prawo do e, używania zachodniej broni, do zapobiegania zbrodniom wojennym. Tak. A teraz część, czas na amerykańską stronę. E, poproszę o pytanie ze strony e, agencji Bloomberg News. The microphone is on. Please hold it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, you spoke about uh, 
individual and, and collective responses to Russia's hybrid attacks on NATO allies, particularly in the eastern flank. Uh, Poland has been one of those targets. Um, the attacks have continued. They've intensified since your remarks in Prague and these, uh, the Bucharest 9 meetings and, and so on. What progress has been made on this collective response, and what, if anything, are you seeking to move forward? And Mr. Foreign Minister, if you could, uh, could respond as well. Um, and also, Mr. Secretary, um, could you just respond to the killing of six UNRWA workers in Gaza this week? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the hybrid attacks, um, exactly as you've said, this is something that we've brought to allies and partners, including at the most recent NATO summit in, in Washington. And the alliance as a whole uh, is seized with this because what we're seeing uh, are attacks in a number uh, of different countries uh, by different means. And while countries in the past might have seen these as one-off events, um, I think it's now clear to uh, everyone that this is part of a deliberate strategy that Russia's engaged in. And what I can tell you is this. We are closely collaborating uh, between ourselves, among uh, different allies and partners, um, on, among other things, uh, sharing the necessary information um, and taking steps uh, to impose consequences on, uh, uh, on Russia for these attacks. Uh, you see that, among other uh, uh, ways, in uh, not only the um, extraordinary uh, sanctions that have been imposed on Russia, but uh, further efforts to, uh, as necessary, increase those, strengthen those, uh, and uh, make sure that um, they're um, imposing a consequence. Um, I think it's critical, though, that there's a recognition, and I know that's felt acutely here in Poland, that the alliance that we're both that we're both part of, and that. Um, so many countries in Europe are a part of, is also uh, the most important guarantor of the safety and security of uh, Europeans uh, and Americans. And so as an alliance, we're also looking at uh, what's happening and we'll draw the necessary uh, conclusions from that and uh, as appropriate uh, consequences. With regard to the, uh, to the attack, look, the first thing that's usually important to, to underscore is the essential, vital, imperative work of humanitarians in Gaza and, for that matter, uh, around the world. And it's ex essential that those activities uh, be protected and, indeed, be, be facilitated. We need to see humanitarian sites protected. Uh, and that's something that um, we continue to raise with Israel. Uh, at the same time, uh, we continue to see uh, Hamas hiding uh, in, taking over, and otherwise using uh, these sites from which to conduct its, uh, its operations uh, and to uh, pose an ongoing threat. And that, of course, has to stop because those actions are uh, endangering civilians. Um, I think. It also underscores, once again, the urgency of reaching a ceasefire, because that's the best way of ensuring that we have um, a genuinely protected space throughout Gaza, uh, a space in which the humanitarians can not only continue to do their work, but massively increase it to the benefit of people who desperately need it, uh, the children, the women, and men uh, of Gaza. <clears throat> Some people think that uh, hybrid warfare is mainly uh, in the domain of information or um, making uh, uh, nuisances of themselves in cybersphere. But I'd like to, uh, you to focus on the fact that um, hybrid warfare has its kinetic elements. Uh, as, a, as I was telling Tony, uh, Polish airspace is um, regularly uh, breached by Russian drones and missiles. Last year, a Russian cruise missile traveled through two-thirds of Poland and landed 10 kilometers from my house. Sooner or later, people will be hurt. Um, it's also uh, terrorist uh, sabotage activities. Some, but not all, we are able to uh, 
uh, prevent, thanks to good collaboration of our intelligence services. And it's also a kinetic assault in uh, collaboration with the uh, uh, Belarusian regime on Poland's eastern border. Um, migrants who, that have been on purpose uh, brought to Russia are then pushed uh, across the EU border. Um, and um, uh, one of our soldiers was actually killed defending the border of NATO, EU, and the Schengen zone uh, from um, these uh, groups armed with um, sticks and knives and, and whatnot. Um, we, of course, reserve the right to protect our uh, territory and our citizens. And I can tell you that uh, if um, uh, another arson uh, hurts a Polish citizen, Poland will take um, bilateral countermeasures that the Russian Fed Federation will notice. Teraz poproszę o pytanie Telewizję TVN24. Uh, hi, hello. Wojciech Skrzypek from TVN24. I have pretty much the same question for you both. So, what's the situation on the front line in Ukraine? And do you believe that Ukraine can still win this war? Thank you. Uh, can Ukraine still win? Yes. In fact, we're determined to see Ukraine win this war. And look, as we look at what's happened over the last uh, more than two years um, since the, the Russian aggression or re-aggression, since this really started in 2014, uh, time and again, we've seen Ukrainian success against the odds. Kyiv, Kharkiv, Kherson, the pushing back of the, uh, of the Russian fleet from the Black Sea, even though Ukraine has no fleet uh, of its own. Um, what's happening now in Kursk? Time and again, the Ukrainian people, supported by an extraordinary coalition of more than 50 countries, have demonstrated that they have the will and, if we sustain it, and we will, the capacity uh, to succeed. So I have, um, I have no doubt about that. Uh, and in fact, if you look at what Putin was trying to accomplish, he's already failed because we know, and just take him at his own word, don't take it from me. His entire purpose was to erase Ukraine from the map, to eliminate its existence as an independent sovereign country, to subsume it into Russia for purposes of recreating a Russian empire. That has failed and cannot succeed. But it's imperative that we continue to support Ukraine so that it can continue to ward off the aggression taking place against it. And as I said earlier, not just that, but continue to build a strong, independent country, increasingly integrated with the institutions of the Euro-Atlantic community, including the European Union and NATO, uh, able to stand on its own feet, militarily, economically, democratically. That's the trajectory it's on. That is success for Ukraine. And that is the most powerful rebuke to everything that Putin has been trying to do. I agree with Tony's every word. Uh, I said it at the UN Security Council and I'll repeat it. Russia has lost plenty of aggressive war, wars she has waged. Uh, Russia lost the Crimean War. Russia lost the Russo-Japanese War. Russia was knocked out of World War I. Russia lost the invasion of Poland in 1920. Uh, Russia lost the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, which I uh, watched um, myself, and Russia lost the first Chechen war, and Russia lost the Cold War. The good news is that every time Russia loses a war, there are reforms. So Russia should lose this war for the sake of Ukraine, for the sake of uh, taboos established after the Second World War, for the sake of guarantees that uh, Russia herself also gave to uh, Ukraine, but also for the sake of the future of Russia. Szanowni Państwo, ostatnie pytanie do, idzie do uh, uh, CBS Agency. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much. Olivia Gazis with CBS News. Uh, as one quick follow-up to my uh, colleague's question, the first question from, from Polsat, um, Mr. Secretary, an understanding a decision may or may not have been made on whether to allow 
Ukraine to use long-range weapons inside of Russia. Would such a capability be accompanied by enhanced intelligence sharing with the U.S. and Ukrainians in order to identify relevant targets in Russia? And then my question for you, Mr. Secretary, is that the Polish government and uh, Minister Sikorsky in particular have been calling for uh, Poland's ability to shoot down missiles over Ukraine heading towards Poland. Um, not only to aid Ukraine's air defenses in the West, but also to assert Poland's uh, ability to self-defend. Uh, so especially given your own observations this week about the delivery of Iranian uh, ballistic missiles now enhancing Russia's capability and flexibility in striking more deeply into Ukraine, do you oppose this Polish proposal? And if so, why? Panie Ministrze, Zachęcam Pana też o komentarze to, to drugie pytanie a, i mam drugie, a, zapytam go po angielsku. Um, Ukraine has threatened to sever relations with Iran upon these revelations again that uh, ballistic missiles have been delivered to Russia for use in Ukraine. Would Poland consider also taking such a diplomatic step or if not, what other costs are you willing to impose on the Iranian regime? Thank you. Olivia, thank you and thank you also for the uh, eloquent uh, demonstration of your Polish. Um, so I can only uh, in this moment repeat what I've, uh, what I've already said. Um, we had uh, good and extensive discussions with our Ukrainian colleagues yesterday about um, how they see the battlefield, um, what, uh, what their needs are, and as I've said, um, we will always continue to take that into account and as necessary we'll adapt, we'll adjust uh, in terms of what we're doing, what we're providing both the United States individually but also the collection of countries that has been supporting uh, Ukraine and you'll understand that I'm not going to get into operational details uh, in, in a public setting but I can again uh, assure that uh, we will adapt, we will adjust and make sure that Ukraine has what it needs when it needs it to deal with this Russian aggression. When it comes to um, these violations that we've seen of uh, Polish uh, airspace uh, and, and, and sovereignty and other allies and partners, um, first, most important, we of course stand by Poland's right to defend itself just as we stand by the right uh, of any of our allies to uh, defend themselves. And we have an ironclad commitment to NATO, uh, to Article 5. Uh, President Biden, when he was here in Poland, said that the United States is committed to defending every square inch of NATO territory, whether that's in Poland or among any other allies. Um, this uh, is an issue that uh, we uh, are discussing uh, among uh, NATO allies because it has implications for the, uh, for the alliance as a whole. Um, but of course, Russia needs to stop these reckless attacks. Uh, the attacks on Ukraine, uh, but also uh, attacks that may implicate uh, other countries, including Ukraine's neighbors. <clears throat> the issue of um, Russian missiles and drones um, crossing NATO territory uh, will not go away. Um, these uh, missiles and drones, Russia launches hundreds of them. Um, a significant proportion of them they lose control over. Uh, we've just had a drone land in Latvia. Uh, we've had incidents with Romania. And there are reports of the Belarusians shooting down drones before they cross into NATO territory. And remember that there are uh, nuclear power stations on the territory of Ukraine. If the Russians lose control of one of these things and one of those, those power stations get damaged, you will all be asking us what, why we hadn't done anything about it before. All of Europe might have a problem. Um, so I believe we should uh, do something about it uh, preemptively. As regards Iran, um, I'm disappointed because uh, we have a new president uh, of Iran. He, he, he sup he's supposedly uh, not as um, aggressive as the previous um, butcher of Tehran. Um, uh, but the policy of um, sending missiles and drones to use against uh, Ukraine and also using similar equipment against Israel seems to be continuing. 
The trouble for Poland uh, is that uh, Iran is already under such severe sanctions that there is uh, not that much more that we can do. Bardzo dziękuję panu sekretarzowi stanu i panu ministrowi za konferencję prasową. Także państwu dziękuję. Do zobaczenia. Do widzenia. Dziękuję.